don't need to know it or need to know it. It's just information. And as you start to raise the awareness of a national consciousness, you will naturally then get into your rights that you have. Uh, now you, one particular extension of Hawaiian national consciousness, Queens Hospital. Queens Hospital was created in 1859 to provide health care to Aboriginal Hawaiians, the natives, at no charge. That is something unique that only Hawaii can boast. Yeah? Other countries in the world, that was not part of their national consciousness. You needed to have money to have access to health care. If you don't have access to health care, probably because you didn't have enough money. That was in the 19th century as well. But here, part of the Hawaiian national consciousness that made it unique was that Queen's Hospital was a quasi-private public hospital. The monarch, the executive monarch, was the perpetual president of the board. Monies that the legislature would grant you know, would go to Queen's Hospital. Okay. 1904, okay. uh, the deputy attorney general Deputy Attorney General in 1904 came out with his opinion from the Territory of Hawaii that the territorial government cannot continue to fund Queens Hospital and have natives have health care with no charge because that is unlawful under American law because that's race-based. What you have right there is a collision between the Hawaiian national pattern and the American national pattern. That's genocide. That's part of denationalization. So from 1904, for every Hawaiian Aboriginal blood who went to Queen's Hospital for health care and paid, that's pillaging. They're going to a, 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 a hospital that was established for the very purpose of providing health care at no charge. And that was part of native tenant rights in the land. And so it's part of that other nation, that Hawaiian national pattern. Very much uh, paternal. You know? Ali'i system, where you take care. This was also incorporated into Hawaiian law called vested rights. See, now that's another example of the Hawaiian national pattern, right? Which was replaced by the American national pattern. And then you see that taking place throughout from the 1900s all the way through. And today, uh, people talk about race-based um, um, legislation. That is an American national pattern. That's not Hawaiian. So we're thinking through the American eyes and through the American lens, when in fact, we have the wrong glasses on. <laughs> so all these things are coming to the fore. So when you start to realize that, wait a minute, Aboriginal Hawaiians, natives, that was our hospital. And they got, car they got hijacked. And that I've been paying Queens Hospital for healthcare when I didn't know it was supposed to be at no charge. Then I start to realize, well, then what do you call that? And the terminology used is, well, that's called pillaging. Robbery, the international word for robbery is pillaging. And pillaging is a war crime. Article 147, Geneva Convention. Pillaging, being an extension of denationalization, now we talk genocide. And one of the effects is not the wiping off or the killing, massive killings, but could lead to deaths. Well, you take a look at the, the natives, our people, and their health care today. Highest on every list. Diabetes, cancer, high blood pressure. That has a direct nexus to Queen's Hospital and the prevention of, uh, of health care at no charge. Because now natives have to go find money, and if they don't have it, then they don't go. And the type of diseases that we are dealing with now, we already dealt with the diseases of the 19th century which caused the creation of Queen's Hospital, such as measles, smallpox. Those were having a decimating effect on the population of Aboriginal Hawaiians because of low immunity. They put that to a halt. Queen's did. Yeah. The type of health that we are suffering from, it's called just bad health. <laughs> no knowledge of why you don't eat so much mac salad you know so much spam you know that's not a hawaiian national pattern 
that was an American national pattern placed on us on survival. So it's, it's, it's a very unique thing. You know one thing I like to also say about Queen's Hospital in the Kingdom era? Did you know that in the Kingdom, they had a problem with prostitution in Honolulu, okay? Because the ships would come in. Native women, prostitutes. They tried to regulate it, the legislature. Penalize it. Wasn't working. They set up a policy now where prostitution was regulated by the Hawaiian government in the 1880s and 90s. And prostitutes, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian prostitutes, would go for free checkup at Queens to make sure they're okay. It was a means of preventive uh, measures. That is powerful. And I remember there was a group of uh, a women, professional women, in the 1890s, who wrote a letter to the president, the, the, the chair of the board of trustees, and said, this is unacceptable. These prostitutes, you know, they are committing crimes. And Queen's Hospital should not be doing this. And the response from that chair, he said, this hospital is for the country. And we need to protect everyone in the country. And he said, he said, I know God would say that too. And that was a means of regulating. Very cool. It's progressive. But see, that's a Hawaiian national pattern. American national pattern, criminalize it. Right. You know, so 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 these are other examples of juxtaposition, yeah, of compare and contrast. And uh, it's an exciting time to learn all this. It is. It just gets you to ask more questions to get more answers. But it is true that we didn't lose anything. We just lost our memory. You can recover that. <laughs> the uh, thing just popped into my head when you were talking. Houselessness, homelessness, um, and then being uh, criminalized for being poor and houseless and homeless. Right. And just, just, just me, but I, I think that lots of Hawaiians wonder why that should even happen. Right. Why is that happening here? I, my mother told me a story once because they lived, she grew up in um, Holuoloa, Makai side. And so I said, where did you, do, where'd you guys live? Did you own your own house? And she said, no. But she had cousins who had several houses. And if a house was empty, someone could go and live in it. So her father was a fisherman. And then they moved into that house. And they knew all the neighbors and they were relatives anyway. And I said, it was that as simple as all that. She said, yeah. That the houses were open, but anyone of the family who came by, they're welcome to take it. See, now that was a, and that'll be a reaction to an American national pattern through a Hawaiian national consciousness. You care for your family. You take care. You take care of the person next to you. Okay, that, that was part of the kingdom era as well. What was also prevented by the American imposition of their national pattern was, did you know that under Hawaiian law, every Aboriginal Hawaiian is able to get land, a fee simple title called a kuleana under the 1851 Kuleana Act, 1850. That's still the, that was the law in the kingdom. Native Hawaiians were not landless. Now, after the takeover, yeah, we became landless, which created additional problems for health. We created problems with economics, with job opportunities. That's genocide. So that was another example. The fact that we don't have land and we're paying these huge amounts of money for property in Honolulu at inflated value. That's not how it was. But that's the American national pattern. Mm -hmm. That's not the Hawaiian national pattern. So you're dealing with a lot of our people today that are surviving Barely. within the American national pattern. Yes. But it's not Hawaiian. It's not. I'm just saying that because I, I live in Waianae now, not too far from the, the harbor. Yeah. Choke Hawaiians. Yeah. Um, and always wondering for myself, like, how, how did we get to this place, you know? Yeah. Um, so that kind of like makes me very upset. In fact, almost everything that you're saying is like making me really upset. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't be helped. But you're right. If you open yourself up and you ask the question, then you need to be prepared for hearing the answer and then trying to figure out what to do now that you have you have asked a question. Information has come your way. Okay. Well, in my in, in, in my experience, there are basically two types of people, and I'm going to be blunt. People may not like what I'm going to say, mm. but it's true. Okay. You either are a decision maker or you're affected by decisions made. 
And sometimes when you think you're a decision maker, you're actually affected by decisions made. This information presents the situation here as who fixes the problem, right? Who's the decision maker or decision makers that can fix this problem? I can tell you right off the bat, it's not us at this level. It's a pattern. So if it's a pattern that is recognized under international law, then who's responsible for the patterns, right? So the United States President, uh, Barack Obama, he's responsible for, for the commission of genocide here in Hawaii. And he would be considered complicit because his predecessors were the ones who were doing it. And it was the original predecessor, when it dealt with Hawaii, called Willie McKinley, that was the principal. He committed genocide. And that was recognized, the concept was recognized in 1898. He committed genocide when they took away and occupied it to build it up militarily and carry out the policies of denationalization disguised as if it was assimilation. See, assimilation is not denationalization. Denationalization is a war crime. Assimilation might be a, uh, an ethical problem <laughs> or a moral problem. It's not a violation of a law. Denationalization is. So he is the culprit right now that is going to be that is going to be held responsible because he has to he's in that position and he can do something to fix the problem if not then he becomes complicit and an accessory the other and the other office notice i'm speaking office and not persons mm. the other office is the governor of the state of hawaii the state of hawaii government that people don't realize did you know that that's actually the hawaiian government that's the hawaiian kingdom government all that was changed in 1893 was the head the queen and her cabinet, replaced by Sanford Dole and his cabinet. That so-called provisional government made a name change to the Republic in 1894. Then in 1900, the Congress made a name change, Territory of Hawaii. Then in 1959, the United States Congress passed another law, another name change, State of Hawaii. That's actually the Hawaiian government. So the, today, the Department of Land and Natural Resources is actually the Interior Department. The Department of Accounting and General Services, that's actually the finance department. It's all there, all the courts in Hawaii, all these courts, these circuit courts from the Kingdom era, 1845. The police department, the National Guard, they're all from the Kingdom era. That's how so few people could take over an entire country. And then once they took it over, then they start the propaganda where they make it appear as if the territorial government or the state of Hawaii government is an American creation. So once you start to see it in that context, you go, wait a minute, this is our government. And they made us believe it's not. That's why you have a sovereignty movement trying to create something out of thin air. The best place to hide anything is right in front of you. And it's always been there. So when you start to see these things, Lynette, it starts to make sense. And the key is how you fix the problem, not how you exacerbate it. So I'm not here to exacerbate the problem. But there is a certain awareness that has to be understood so that when change does come from a decision maker, which will affect decisions made, ultimate change. So when you go back to 1893, we're basically just turning it, instead of it going right with the military with the takeover, now it's going to go left. That governor's office, that's the office of the monarch. It's a chief executive office. That's what Queen Lilibu Kalani was. Those are the kind of things that we need to understand. Uh, the ideas of genocide, war crimes, they're gonna be used to, um, uh, as leverage to fix this problem. Because when people start to feel the, the heat, that these are real issues, then you're really gonna want a decision maker to make some decisions. And a decision that is lawful and maintainable. <laughs> and not somebody just saying something. So. These are good things to think about because I think what happens is <clears throat> we have enough information to figure out where we want to situate ourselves with the expectation that something's going to happen down the road. Certain changes will come about. It's kind of like once you raise consciousness, it's not like you can lower it. Yeah. I mean, once people get it, they can't unget it. Um, so you make some assumptions that things are moving along, and, and the more information you have, the more you're able to figure out where do you situate yourself in the future because this information is coming it can't stop I mean it's just is happening and so that it's going to change everybody so what is 
what is the best thing for us to do, considering the fact that change is going to come. I think about this all the time, by the way, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. It's just, we got to get ready. Yeah. And change comes through the National Guard, in our case. Just as change was made in 1898, a national pattern. So we had to figure out, my great grandparents had to figure out how does this American system work? You know, do we need to get elected officials to Washington? Okay, well, how do we do that? Okay, let's create the Democratic Party. Okay, Democratic Party, principles of Jefferson, strict adherence to the Constitution. That was David Kawan on the that created the Democratic Party here. Did you know their argument was you cannot annex a foreign territory by passing a law? That is Jeffersonian philosophy, <laughs> strict interpretation of the Constitution. So they were using these to address the issue, right? But then as time progressed, as the control was firmly held, we had to survive. And that's when we just had to live by this national pattern. Now, living in this illegal national pattern does not make it lawful, right? It's like being kidnapped. You're being forced to survive, and you're doing whatever the kidnap tells you. By being forced to survive and listening to the kidnapper did not make you adopted, right? You still kidnap, but now it's psychological. So how we get out of that is we need to normalize this information. So when we speak of the Hawaiian kingdom, it's the country, it's not a group. Yeah? When we talk about Hawaiian subjects, it's a nationality, it's not an ethnicity. When we talk about language, when we talk about denationalization, those are important terms to know, but we got to get used to it. Yes. And like we say in Hawaii, just get mild with it. You know, it's okay. Well, one of the things I know is changing is this idea of referring to the United States as a mainland. I mean, it's a small thing, right? But every time I, I read it, every time I have a conversation with someone who says, yeah, we're going to go to the mainland, it's always like a correction. You're going to the U.S., right? <laughs> you, know, you just and, say and, that. And, and you know who coined the word mainland? No. Sanford Dole. Smart dude. Yeah, because he coined the word mainland in order to entice Americans to come to Hawaii. <laughs> that he was encouraging migration. He, he used the word mainland. And today we use it. See, that's another word we got to change. Yes. Another word of, of we're colonized. No, that's the American narrative. You know, that's you're promoting what they said happened here. Because when you colonize, that implies you're not a country. So if you're not a country, then that means you never had a national pattern. So what's your argument? I mean, like, what are you guys doing then? Yeah. I know. Yeah, so occupation is what you're supposed to use. Now when you use occupation, now you're getting into more crimes. Yeah. Now, see, now we can talk about genocide within humanitarian law and not speak about genocide as a human rights law, as we used to before, you know? Because massive killings is a war crime itself. It is, it's a war crime, mass killings. So you didn't need to create the word genocide under humanitarian law to make that a war crime. It was already a war crime since 1919. That's why Professor Lemkin in 1944 said, genocide is systemic. It, it, it's based on a pattern of oppression, not upon a specific kill or killing or killings. Yeah. This is so useful. Yeah. Useful, it's a thinking thing for me, right? So it's like a thought problem and I gotta go home and for the rest of the day think about what all of this kind of means to me. And because I'm teaching again in the fall okay. and then trying to figure out how to introduce this kind of stuff and I, I'm sure there's teachers watching yeah. and my guess is that as soon as they get a handle on what you just said and do their own research and check it out that it might be useful to actually begin to introduce these ideas in the school system because you know we're big, we can do what they did right exactly yeah, so we just, just reverse do it, what they yeah, did reverse it, um, and that there are students coming up who will find themselves to me eventually that I don't have to teach because they'll already know it. Yeah. Uh, they'll be instituting uh, uh, a new national consciousness or, or, an up, <laughs> or an old one. We're recovering our old, our yeah. original national consciousness. Yeah, so it's all pretty exciting. Well, there's a blog, as you know, hawaiinkingdom.org slash blog. Mm -hmm. A lot of up-to-date information there, things that are very current. Uh, issues of terminology uh, is up there. The, the purpose of the blog is to <sighs> expose but base it upon facts base it upon reliable information that can be verified and quantified and qualified do you find academics in general supportive of of this way of thinking you know, just raise the issues bring it forward 
Um, I think academics, if they stick to being an academic, they shouldn't have a problem because it's, it's, this hits all the, uh, the methodology, theoretical framework, and information that can be falsified. Okay, that's what research is. Research is, can you falsify this information? When a person gets a PhD, as you know, or a master's, they don't argue their master's degree. They don't argue their PhD. They defend it. They're defending it from professors on their committee that are trying to falsify it. So if they stick to the aspect of falsification, they shouldn't have a problem. But once the academics start to now get into politics and they start to push an agenda, see, then they get into rhetoric, not research. And the rhetoric is the art of convincing and becoming very selective with historical facts, which is confirmation bias. You Why? Confirm your old bias. Why? It's personal. They, they've left the academy to be politics. They, 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 they're trying to argue. That is not what we should do as academics. We should teach, you know, and we should in, encourage research on this. Right. That's what we should do. We shouldn't have an agenda other than being a good academician, since we're academics ourselves. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't see it happening, uh, unfortunately. I'm always looking yeah. for new research that's coming up because I, wanna, I want people to talk about what they're doing in their research, and they're so excited about it anyway. And it's new. That's well, the whole point, right? It's new. Right. And yet, I'm not sure whether the University of Hawaii, anyway, is actually encouraging they're not. that kind of... I'll be upfront, they're not. And you know why? It's an extension of uh, uh, genocide. Here's the connection. Research is based upon money. You got to get grants, right? So you get grants to talk more about Native Hawaiians as indigenous people than getting a grant to do research on Hawaii status as an occupied state or whether or not Hawaii's government was overthrown as opposed to its state. So what ends up happening is the American national pattern reinforces themselves here. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much what it is. It's it, it, University of Hawaii. Let's is just a maintain the base. status quo. Status quo. Let's just don't rock the boat. That's what it comes down to. Well, that's what some people may think on their own, but that's not me, mm -hmm. because obviously, I, yeah, because I, you know, you might say when I got my PhD, I was going against the grain on everybody's mind, but the key is it's 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 information, and we owe this to our country, we owe this to our past, not our present. To make it right. Well said. And we are like right out of town, out of time Perfect. right now. Thanks, Kiana, for being here and for, for sharing your thoughts.